Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm Pastor Ken, and welcome. Thank you for being here today. I want to give a shout out to all the folks that are tuned in with us online. Thank you for being a part of our faith community. Today, I'm excited because we're going to start a new series. And you know, this week, I was traveling. I went to spend a day with my pastor down in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, Pastor Chris Hodges. And on my way home, okay, if you've watched the news or anything about it, I was stranded in an airport for three days. Actually, they were telling me there was no way I was going to get back for Sunday. But in the midst of it, studying for this series, I think God's given me a little pathos, which in other words, making me one with my message, because here's the new series we're starting today. It's called Tough as Nails. You know, we have a tendency when things don't go our way, we can bend, we can bend, but, but we need to toughen up. We need to be people because we need to understand. And so as we begin, today's an introduction. I want to talk to us as we start about branding. Do you know what branding is? Branding simply is this. Branding is is what people think when they think about you, your product, or your organization, right? Now, we all are familiar with it, right? What is, when you see this brand, what do you, next one, here you go. When you see that, what's that? Nike. Nike, right? And what do you think of? Just do it, right? Yeah, it's a brand. What do you think of this? What's this? It's Apple, right? And what do you think? Think different, right? Here's one. What do you think of that? What's it? Starbucks. I just think of good coffee. They don't have a model, but okay. Here's another one. They were the starter of the brand. And I, I kind of had this revelation as I was thinking about branding this week. You know, this is it on a vertical level, but when you've had too much McDonald's and it's gone on a horizontal level, I think this is what happens to your derriere, but no, I'm sorry. That's <laughs> bottom line. We, but here's the point. We're all familiar with branding. And in Christianity today, we have a branding problem. Why? Because what do you think of when you hear the term Christian? What does the world at large, what is the culture we live in, when they hear the term Christian, what comes to their mind? Anybody want to give them a shout out? Hypocrite, judgmental, uptight, right? Yeah, all the things, right? But when's the last time, listen to me, when's the last time the word fearless has entered your mind when you hear the term Christian? And that's why this series is so important because I believe there's time for a rebranding, a realization, because why? We live in an era where fear and uncertainty dominate the landscape, right? I mean, we hear reports every day of violence in our streets, economic uncertainty. We have terrorism that is going on everywhere around us. In fact, today is Palm Sunday. And somebody told me at first service, and I checked it on my news feed. Yeah, ISIS today bombed two churches in Egypt. Okay, two Christian churches in Egypt. Because we live in this day where it's been awakened to us ever since 15 and a half years ago here in America when 9-11 occurred. It created this heightened sense of uncertainty and looming pending difficulty or problems or fear. And it resurfaces when Paris happened, when Brussels happened, when Nice happens, when San Bernardino happens, when Orlando happens, when Charleston happens, when all this goes on. We live in a day when all of this is around us. In fact, fear is at a fevered pitch. We just went through an election season, and I don't care what side of the aisle people are on politically. Everybody seemed like their hair was on fire. That if so-and-so gets in office, it's all over. When they, if this person gets in office, it's, not, it's at the end of the world. And both people were screaming, and our country is in this heightened state. And what's happened is this. The Christian community has gotten caught up in all of that as well. In fact, even, listen to me, even our faith is under attack. There's a ministry called Open Door Ministry. The Washington Post, January 16th of 2016, reported this. It's from Open Door Ministry, which has been around about 60 years. They catalog the persecution of Christians worldwide. And this is what they wrote. In 2015 was the worst year for Christian persecution. Now, they didn't take records back in the Roman days and served during the eras, okay? But now, in this modern age, okay, 2015 only outgunned 2014, the year before it, okay? And I haven't gotten the statistics on the 16 yet, but 
what they reported in this article was more than 7,100 Christians were killed for faith-related reasons, and 2,400 churches were destroyed or damaged. In fact, the president of Open Door Ministries, Dr. David Curry, he said this. He said, the level of exclusion, discrimination, and violence against Christians is in some countries has risen to a level akin to ethnic cleansing. And now what I would say is this is a time when our faith should matter more than ever. Okay? But what's amazing to me, and as a pastor I see this, is that when situations arise, when life doesn't go the way we expect it to go, that's many of the time when Christians or people who have faith abandon their faith or walk away. They have this idea, and it's false ideology, which is why I want to handle this series on this hand, is that people have this idea that if I'm good, if I'm following God, then nothing bad will ever happen. That bad things never happen to good people. So when life doesn't happen the way they think it is, Many of them say, well, that's it, I'm, I, I've had it. And I don't know where anybody ever got that idea, especially regarding Christianity, because the very roots, the history of Christianity is something very, very, very bad happening to somebody who was very, very good. That's the start of all of this. And so it's important because I think it's in time that we go back to our roots and understand what is our brand based on? Or who is our brand based on? So if you're taking notes with me this morning, look it. Here's the deal. The Christian brand is supposed to be based on the author of our faith. In other words, where did Christianity come from? Christ. It means to be a Christ follower. To be a Jesus follower. Jesus, this is what I want us to address today. Jesus was fearless. Jesus lived his life fearless, and therefore to be a follower of Jesus means that we should be as well. And we can live our lives beyond the uncertainty of our times. We can face it with courage. We can face it with a sense of fearlessness, no matter what comes our way. Why? Because of the author of our faith. In fact, that again is my hope for this series, is the opportunity to rebrand Christianity, especially for people who are a part of Vertical Church, that when people think of a Christian, they're gonna think about people who are fearless, people who will love even when it costs me, that they care enough to get involved, that they're not, they're not shy, they're not, mo when problems occur, when, when difficulties happen, they're not the people that run from it, they're the people that run to it, to provide help, to provide hope, they're the people that love enough to get involved, they're the people who do not care what it costs them personally, they're people that live on point, that live on mission, to understand what we've been called to, and to provide the help and hope, we're the people who can love our enemies, not get into the fray of all the craziness in our world, World, that we're not the people who flinch, the people who back down, the people who give up, who give in, who run and turn chicken and are waiting because in the Christian community for too long, people have been hiding, people have been sheltered, people have been waiting, oh Jesus, please come back, and we've missed it. We have not understood the faith that we've been called to, the times that the Bible has, and it's now time that we are the people who can fulfill the mission of Christ in this generation. Why? Because our God hasn't changed. We can live our lives fearless. We can love without, without the concern of what it costs us. We can engage. We can be a part. We can offer help, hope, rescue for a, for a generation desperately in need of it. And that's why today, today, it's important that we need to go back to the very roots of where it all began. And so today, as we talk about it, I want to talk to you about Jesus the author of our faith. Because today's Palm Sunday, and we're gonna deal with the last week of Jesus' life. But listen to me. The problem that we have today, that the branding problem, some of it is, is because of the artwork that's existed you know, since the Renaissance era. When people think about Jesus, okay, what we're gonna talk about today, there's no way either one of these figures or images would ever be able to have handled what came his way. Okay, that's a problem. We have a part of it is the artwork that's around us. All of this stuff since the Renaissance era, people trying to depict Jesus. Even the movies. I mean, when I was a kid, these two movies were impactful on me. Next slide. This one from Jesus of Nazareth, and this one is from uh, uh, The Greatest Story Ever Told. 
But I'm going to tell you what, neither one of these dudes could handle the true image. I mean, how would you cash Jesus? What would you, what, what, who would you ask to fulfill the role of Jesus? You know, I was thinking about it because in preparing for this, I'm like, well, how, who would I cash for Jesus? Probably a nonviolent Dwayne Johnson. I mean, Jesus was the original rock, okay? The bottom line is this. How do you, how do you actually deal with it? But today, I want to look at the raw, the real, the Jesus of the Bible, because that's, that's the problem in today's culture. People have all these ideas about Jesus without ever reading the text, without ever understanding what he went through. So if you have a Bible today, I want you to turn to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews. And as you're turning there, this is a question that I want us to wrestle with through the entirety of this series. And that's this. What would you, re how would you respond if you were absolutely sure God was with you? In other words, when you face difficulties, when challenges come your way, how would you respond if you were absolutely sure God was with you? If you're finding in the book of Hebrews, listen, let me tell you, the writer of the book of Hebrews is writing in a dark era of the Christian faith because at this particular time that he's writing this particular letter, these were Jewish followers of Jesus, people who were raised in the Jewish religion who came to believe that Jesus was their Messiah. And now persecution had arisen. Difficulties had happened. Now following Jesus was not easy, wasn't convenient. And in the Jewish community, many of them, their families abandoned them. They, their, their, their careers, their, their vocations were based on their community and, and who they grew up with. And now their communities didn't want anything to do with them. So they had no jobs. Their resources were tapped. They were persecuted. They were, they were mocked. They were treated difficultly in the society that they're living. And so many of them, we're contemplating the idea, is it worth it? They were thinking about turning back, abandoning their faith. And that's why this letter is so brilliant. Because it writes to them the reasons, the rationales of why. What is our faith based upon? Is it worth it? He points this, if you found Hebrews 12, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. The writer here says, therefore... We also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, you have to remember when these letters were written, because they weren't written in chapter and verse. All that was created for us for reference sake and everything else. This was a letter written to Hebrew Christians, Christians that were raised in the Hebrew faith, that were now following Jesus. It's difficulty. And in chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews, he had explained to them all of these great patriarchs of the faith, Abraham and Moses and, and Noah and, and, and Rahab and all these different people. And he shows the difficulties that they had endured for their faith. And he's saying, before you retreat, before you give up, remember where you came from. What is all this about? He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, imagine if they had given up we wouldn't have had the Messiah. Imagine if they had given up. We wouldn't have had this ability to be forgiven by God in the manner of, we wouldn't have what we now possess if they had allowed the, the, the troubles in their generation to cause them to, 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 to turn back. He says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. And then he turns to it this, looking to who? Jesus. Why look to Jesus? You know, Abraham, all those, but now he turns it and makes it personal. If we're truly Christians, what's our faith based on? Jesus, looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. In other words, all that we believe begins and ends in Christ, that it's all. All of that was to get him to come, and now our faith, he's the one that's working in us to perfect or mature our faith. And now it says, looking to Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the what? The cross. Now to us, the cross is a piece of jewelry. It's an ornament in a church. But in Jesus' day, Jesus grew up in ancient Judea. And he had seen the Roman government from his childhood. Crucified people, he had smelt the pain. Crucifixion was a horrible form of death. And it was to show the utter dominance of the Roman Empire that you do not defy Rome because this is your fate. 
who for the joy that was set before, endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse three, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. You're worried, man, somebody gave you a dirty look. Or somebody did, oh wow, I gave someone an invitation to Easter and they were like, oh, I can't, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I can make it. Oh, we're gonna wither, oh my God. You know, I was watching, I was in a, in, a, in a terminal and I had to recognize, really does it matter, Ken, you're indoors. You're, this ain't nothing what Jesus endured. And you're gonna lose your temper, no. Be kind, it's not their own fault. Dude, what do you believe? Toughen up. Sometimes we're a little bit too snowflakey. It means when the heat comes, we're gone, okay? No, but consider him. We're supposed to think about Jesus, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. Why? And Ivy says, so that, here in New King James, it says, least you become weary and discouraged in your souls. So when you think things are going bad, consider Jesus. And then verse four, you've not resisted to blood, striving against sin. See, we have forgotten Jesus. What does it teach us? He's the author and finisher of our faith. If you're taking notes of me this morning, you need to see this, that faith is the antidote to fear. Why? Because fear is faith in the wrong things. Think about the stuff you fear. Oh, I fear I won't be able to pay the bills. Well, that's something that hasn't happened yet, right? And you believe, oh, oh, oh. See, fear is faith in the wrong things, okay? But what is faith? The biblical definition of faith, Hebrews 11.1 1 says this, faith, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not See, now all of us, we've exhibited faith in our lives, whether you realize it or not. There's a biblical definition of faith, but how many of you ever had a job? Okay, you go to work, your employer that hired you said, we're gonna pay you so much money after you know, the end of the week or two weeks or whenever our pay time is, you go to work and we'll pay you. And what, you went to work by faith. Okay, you didn't have the money, you believed that what? They were gonna do what they said they were gonna do, right? Have you ever shopped online? Okay, well you saw something, right? You clicked, you put your credit card, you put your money down, you didn't have the product yet, did you? But you had confidence that they were what? Gonna fulfill the promise, they're gonna send you what you're buying. So we all understand faith at some level, but you have to understand biblical faith, here it is. It's believing God is who he said he is, and that he will do what he said he will do. You see, there's the confidence. Believing God is who he said he is. You have to believe that God's all powerful, that God is, there's no problem with him being able to achieve all that he said he would do. And the other side of faith is you have to believe he's willing. And that's where a lot of people check out. Well, you know, God, I asked him for this. And because, you know, four days went by, you know, God, I need a date for this, this event that's coming up. And, you know, something happened like, well, you know, God didn't. Do. So either we assess God wasn't able or he didn't care. But think about it, have you ever been a parent? Do you give everything your kids want at the moment they want, the scream, cry, and have a fit? No, you realize a good parent that's a loving parent have to teach their children there is delayed gratification. I know in this generation people don't think that is because if the delay is any more than a click, then forget it. I swipe, I swipe left, I'm moving on. No, no, the reality of it is God is bigger than the situations we're going through. Can you trust him? Even when you don't know what's going down, can you have confidence that he will come through? Because all that Hebrews had written in Hebrews 11, every one of those people, there was Abraham's promise took multiple, multiple years before that child was ever born. Imagine if he just went nine months and said, well, that's it, forget it. God, you're not big enough, out of here, okay? No, the Bible teaches us that God is always working on our behalf. Can you trust him? Because just as a child who's not mature enough, who's not old enough to understand all that a true caring and loving parent is doing on their behalf, they just have to learn that mommy, daddy, they know best, trust. And God Almighty is the ultimate father who cares about us. And you and I need to see it, but the thing that you have to understand, our faith, 
Who is it based on? It's based on Jesus. And so I want you to look at this. As I've been preparing for this, this season coming up, in my own personal devotional time, I've been reading back through the gospel accounts, meditating on it for me personally, all that Jesus went through. And this fascinated me. Because before Jesus came to the city of Jerusalem, in Matthew's gospel, it says this. Before we enter Jesus last week, right on the pinnacle of coming into the city of Jerusalem, it says, now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. And on the way, he took the 12 aside and said to them, and look what Jesus says. We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and teachers of the law, and they will condemn him to death. Verse 19. And will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And on the third day he will rise to life. In fact, you know what? Matthew records he actually told them three times along the way. But this is right before he entered the city of Jerusalem. And why I say people haven't had a right impression or an understanding of who Jesus is. Here's the key. Jesus knowing. All of this awaited him. Jesus didn't lurk in the shadows. He wasn't hiding out in, you know, beyond public view. No, how did Jesus enter the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday? He came in right before all of his enemies, riding on the colt of a mule. Why? Because Zechariah had already said that this is how the Messiah will come. He came right before his enemies, knowing what happened, knowing what it was in front of Jesus. You see, your Savior, my Savior, he was braver than hell. He was stronger than steel. He was tougher than nails. Jesus came boldly in plain sight right into the middle of the city knowing what would happen. Jesus taught every day public. In fact, on this day that we celebrate of him coming into the city of Jerusalem, what's the first thing he did upon arising into the city? He went straight into the temple. He overthrew the money changers' tables, kicked out all of those. That's why I said this ain't no wimp. This was a man's man. This was, but listen, Jesus, right before all of them, he was knowing what would happen. He was not hiding. He wasn't lurking in the shadows. Jesus took their questions every day during the week. He fought publicly. See, his enemies were cowards. They tried to do everything that they were lurking and trying to do in the nighttime when nobody else was around. Jesus went full public. In fact, one of the things that so amazed me when Matthew's gospel said it this way, one of his final teachings this last week, he taught publicly about the hypocrisy of his own enemies. He was no wimp. He was tougher than nails. In fact, when Jesus was arrested, he wasn't arrested from a cave in En Gedi, hiding out like David and his soldiers did. He wasn't arrested trying to go across the border, fleeing into another state. He wasn't arrested at the seaport of Joppa, trying to get on a boat and beat it out of town like Jonah. No, Jesus was full on. In fact, when the guards showed up to arrest him, he asked, who is it you seek? He wasn't hiding. He didn't say, hey, Pete, tell him you're me. No, he didn't throw nobody else under the bus. Jesus said, who is it you seek? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. And what did he say? I am he. They fell over under his power. He didn't resist. He didn't go. In fact, one of the strongest, most powerful realities is when you have power, immense power, and you don't use it to vindicate yourself to cause violence, but you're willing, having all power to lay it down to help others. When Jesus was on trial, never once through all of the lies, through all of the testimony, through all the things that were thrown at him, never once did he defend himself. Even before Pilate, who was the Roman procurator, he was amazed and astounded. He said, you hear all these things they're saying? Don't you offer one word in your own defense? See, the power is when you have the ability Ability to control yourself. And Jesus told Pilate, when Pilate said to him, don't you realize what authority I have? I could almost hear him laugh, go, oh, authority, bro. You'd have nothing unless my Father in heaven gave it to you. 
I could right now call 10 legions of angels to defend me. No, dude, come on, let it happen. Make my day. I think Clint Eastwood got it from Jesus, okay? And Jesus, because look at, look at what happened to your Savior, my Savior. Jesus, our author of our faith, he was betrayed by a friend. You know, how many people have walked away from their faith because somebody in the faith didn't do what they thought? There's so many. I'm glad. If you're here, you're back checking out Christianity again. Glad you're here today. But you know how many people have walked away because people in the Christian faith have hurt their feelings? Jesus was betrayed by a friend. Okay? He got the kiss of death from Judas, right? One of the closest. In fact, on the night of that Passover dinner, Jesus looked over at Jesus and said, do what you got to do. Go do it quickly. Go ahead, bro. Be the coward that you are. Go do it. I'm ready. Right? And then what? He was unjustly arrested. They came at night. They didn't even give him the dignity. Was he a criminal? What charge was he guilty of? Why weren't they willing to do so during the day? In fact, he was unjustly, he was illegally tried and convicted. It's fascinating. When you read the four accounts, the gospel accounts, you realize that Jesus underwent six trials, and all of them were illegal. In fact, he was tried by the Jewish people in the middle of the night, which was against the Jewish faith. He was taken first to the home of Annas. Uh, Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was at that time the, 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 um, the chief priest, but he was a power broker pulling the strings. It was a corrupt system that had engulfed all of Israel, okay? And so he tried Jesus first, sent him over to Caiaphas. Caiaphas tried him in his home, and then... Before, the, the, when, before sunrise, they, call, they get, gathered the Sanhedrin, but they didn't even call the full council because they knew Jesus had supporters there. They only gathered the ones that they knew were against him. They got false testimony. They couldn't even co corroborate their testimonies. All that they did to Jesus was entirely illegal. In fact, the only thing they had to convict him of, Caiaphas asked him under oath, are you the Messiah? What was Jesus going to say? Was he going to lie? He said, it is exactly what you say. And you will see all that Daniel said of me come to pass. He tore his robe and said, there's no media anymore. Testimony. He's blasphemed. He's declared himself the Messiah. That's why they killed him. For telling the truth. Your Savior, my Savior, was so tough, he was willing to tell the truth, even though it meant his life. Why are we not willing to tell the truth? in our marriages, in our workplaces. We need to live fearless lives. Listen, our Savior, then what happened? He was illegally convicted. Because he went, he went through three trials. Pilate tried him once, sent him over to Herod. Herod tried him, sent him back to Pilate. And Pilate had him what? His first resolution, he had him flogged. Now, that term, you can lose something on this. As I was studying this week, it's fascinating because many different ancient cultures use flogging. In the Jewish culture, they would flog with a whip, okay? And they would do it 39 times because by Deuteronomy, the law in Deuteronomy said 40 lashes. Any more beyond that was, was, was against the law. So they always did 39 to make sure that they didn't miscount. But the Romans, this is not Jewish. That's why Paul said, I was given 39 lashes by the Jews five times. Paul wasn't scourged by the Romans. And what's the difference? The Romans took those leather whips, and they added bone and lead to it, okay? Let me get graphic on you for just a minute, because you need to know what our Savior endured. Romans had no limit on how many lashes their victims had. The responsibility of a Roman, the person responsible, the litigator, is what they call the person literally that, that whipped them, their responsibility was to bring them near their death but not kill them. Josephus, the ancient Jewish historian, said that many died actually at the flogging. You know, hyperbolic, they, there's so much loss of blood. But what was it? Let me tell you how these flogging did. They would chain their hands to a post. They would strip them butt naked, okay? I know this offends some of you in your thinking of your Savior, but let me tell you what he endured on your behalf. Then they would whip, and that because of the bone and the lead that was there, it was, in, it was intended to rip the skin, and to expose it. Because Romans called a person that was flogged half dead. Okay? And then they would turn him around because the first side 
was to do the front. I don't even have to tell you as a man what that would look like. Flipping them. Are you kidding me? But that's what your Savior and my Savior went through. And why did Pilate do such? See, he thought, Pilate believed Jesus was actually innocent, but he wasn't tough. He was himself a coward. He was trying to assuage the crowd and give them the bloodlust they wanted because he brought out Jesus before the crowds and showed him all flogged and whipped and beaten. And where we get the term in, in, in Latin, he said, Ecce homo, behold the man. He figured that anybody who had a shred of human decency would say, oh, it's enough, forget it. But no, they cried out for what? His, ex for his execution. So Jesus was not only flogged, ultimately, because look at what happened. Go back to the scriptures. I want to tell you, after he was flogged, they stripped him. They put a scarlet robe on him. Verse 29. And then they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. And they put a staff in his right hand. And then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews, they said. Verse 30. And then they spit on him. And they took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. Verse 31, and after they had mocked him, they took him off his robe and put it on his clothes. And they led him away to crucify him. Because ultimately, your Savior, he was given, go back to the other one, guys, now. He was ultimately given the maximum sentence, crucifixion. Crucifixion. You see, the Romans, something important that you have to understand. The Romans didn't invent crucifixion. What the Romans did is they perfected it. And what is crucifixion? They take a person and they, drill, they, they take a nail two inches in diameter and drive it through the bone of the wrist and the hand area. And if you know anything about anatomy, you realize that there is a nerve ending there that goes all the way to the brain. It's one of the most painful realities. But crucifixion wasn't intended to be a quick death. It was a slow and painful death because here's the deal with the Romans. It was about shame. It was about disgrace. It was about to make an example that would bear an understanding to all who would behold. I was in Jerusalem. I saw the place because I never in a movie have I ever seen it depicted correctly. When they would take victims of crucifixion, they put them right on the major thoroughfares, right along the road there. Because, and then as a victim was laying there, they were stripped totally naked. So women, Children, people would pass by, and they were to look up. And not only would the shame and disgrace be overwhelming to the victim, but it would be a, a, a lesson, the Romans. It's their brutality. It was that way of saying, we own you. Don't you ever think that you can arise against Rome. Jesus went through all of that, and look what happened as he was on it. Because in the city of Jerusalem during Passover time, the city of Jerusalem in the days in which Jesus lived, Population was about 100,000 people who lived there. During the Passover, it would swell to 300,000. 200,000 people would come to the city of Jerusalem for the ancient Passover. And therefore, you can imagine all of the people passing by on that roadway that Jesus is hung there, naked, crucified, beaten to a pulp. And look at what happened. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. Verse 41. And in the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. Verse 42. And he saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. Yeah, sure. But you and I need to recognize this. Why could Jesus be fearless? Why could Jesus endure all that? Why could Jesus go through it? Because listen, if you're taking notes, and this is critical, listen, listen. Fearlessness is based on the confidence that God is with us. See, the night in which Jesus was sharing the Passover meal with his friends, John 16, none of his followers understood this. Jesus had been clear what it meant to follow him. He had told them on multiple occasions the difficulties that they would endure for following him. But at this moment, even though he had told them what was going to happen, they didn't believe it. They didn't understand it. And even on the night of the Passover meal, in John 16, Jesus said these words to them, a time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered, each of you to his own home, 
and you will leave me all alone. In other words, guys, all of you are going to bug out. All of you are going to leave me. All of you are going to abandon me. All of you, everything you've ever believed about me, you're going to just say, it's over, over, forget it. It's not true. But he said, yet I'm not alone, for my Father is with me. Jesus was fearless because why? You see, he had the whole history of the nation of Israel before him. When God had spoken, see Psalm 27, one says, the Lord is the light of my salvation, from whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, for whom shall I be afraid? When God spoke to, 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 to uh, Moses and said, I want you at the burning bush to go and deliver my people out of the land of Egypt, out from under Pharaoh's control. Moses said, who am I? How can I go? God said, I will be with you. In other words, it's not about who you are. It's about who I am. When Joshua was about to lead the people into the promised land, Joshua came. He was fearing this reality because now Moses was dead. God says to Joshua, Moses, my servant is dead. I could just imagine Joshua going, thanks, God. Like, sure, I didn't know that. Wow, you're reminding me of my worst nightmare. Moses is dead. Now the responsibility lies with me. How do you follow? I mean, imagine if you had the responsibility of following in Moses' shoes. My goodness, you talk about intimidating. Wow, the dude can split the sea. He can cause water to come out of a rock. All right? And now you got to follow up after him. But God said to him, as I was with Moses, so will I be with you. In other words, Joshua, what you're being asked to do, it's not about you, it's about who is with you. You and I need to recognize, see, when the three Hebrew children were in the nation of Babylon and the king Nebuchadnezzar said to them, bow or you'll be thrown into the fiery furnace. You see, they had already, they were students of the ancient scriptures. They knew Isaiah 43, two said, when you go through the, when you walk through the fire, I will be with you. They believed God was who he said he was and that he would do what he said he would do. See, fearlessness creates heroic aspects. Those Hebrew children said, no, king, we will not bow to you. And even if you throw us into the fiery furnace, how could they be so fearless? Because they knew God was with them. Why was Daniel, when he opened up the lines then, he said, God sent his angel who was with me. The nation of Israel had the presence of God, whether it was in the, in, the, in, the, in the wilderness, over the tabernacle that God had built through Moses, or in the temple in Jerusalem. Why should they not fear any nation? See, they lost sight of their faith. And we in the Christian community have lost sight of what our faith is based on. What's our brand? Our savior was fearless because he was absolutely confident that his father was with him. And then Jesus said these words to the disciples right on his heels. He said, my father is with me. Verse 33, six, John 16, 33 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but do not but, said, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Now you see, he realized all that would happen that night, but he knew the day would come when he arose from the dead, that these words would come alive in their hearts. That yes, Jesus never promised us that we wouldn't face difficulties. Jesus never promised us. He said right here, in the world, you will have trouble. But what? why should we be fearless? Because I have overcome the world. You and I can be assured of this reality that Christ is with us. In fact, in, in, when Jesus gave, the, 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 after he arose from the dead and he gave the great commission, he said to them this, and Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. And then he said, therefore you go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And why can we be assured? See, why is it so important to me that we as a church refocus on this? Because we can finish this. We can stay on mission, no matter what difficulties, because the Bible is replete with understandings about the days in which we live. And there is difficult times ahead, but we have nothing to fear. We can live fearless lives, because why? Jesus says, surely I am with you always 
to the very end of the age, which is why it's important that we understand if you're taking notes. Here's the big thing I want to wrap it up with. Listen, listen, listen. Listen. Uncertainty is unavoidable, but fear is optional. Yes, we live in uncertain times. Yes, there are difficulties going on all around us. Uncertainty is unavoidable, but fear is optional. And why can we have confidence? Why can we be fearless? Because he was, so can we be. Because of what he achieved, so it gives us the ability to know that God is bigger than all the circumstances, situations, and difficulties that we face. So ask the question again, how would you respond if you were absolutely sure God was with you? I want to leave you with these closing thoughts. Listen, listen. And that's this. Is our version of Christianity willing to stand against adversity to see his will done personally and in our world? In other words, is the version of Christianity you believe, are you willing to endure adversity, to be faithful to God, even when your friends, even when your family, even when everybody else isn't, are you, is the version of Christianity you embrace willing to stand against adversity to see his will done in your life or in your world? Is your version of Christianity worth dying for? Think about that. And lastly, is the way you live worth the price Jesus paid for it? Here's what I want you to do this week. Two things, simple. I know I went through a lot, but here's the basis, the foundation. I hope you stay with me through the whole series because it's going somewhere good. But I wanted you to know where it all started with. So we have a branding problem because we need to see the true Jesus of the Bible. We didn't know what this all based on. Our Savior was tough as nails. And he expected you and I that we can be as well. That we should be a people that can change the idea of what people think about when they think about Christianity. They can see as a people who are fearless, a people who are willing to care, a people who are willing to love, a people who are willing to help, to provide help and hope no matter how dark, no matter how difficult, no matter how trying the times come, that believing that our God is big enough, believing that our faith is strong enough, believing that no matter what, that we can be braver than hell, tougher than steel, okay? And tougher than nails, why? because our savior was, that's what it means to follow him. So here's what I want you to do this week, to take some time out of your daily schedule. If you don't have a personal time that you spend with God, if you don't have a devotional time, make it. Just do me this favor, just take 10 minutes out of your day. I want you to think about, okay, what we talked about today. Go over the scriptures that we are looking at and ask yourself, God, what are you saying to me? Where am I? Am I strong? Do I believe? Where's my faith? What is it based on? Allow yourself to see the Jesus of the Bible, maybe in a way you haven't been willing to look at him before. To realize what he endured on your behalf. To realize all that he went through, he did for you. He considered you worth it. And just ask yourself the question, is the life that I'm leading worth the price he paid? For me, that I can find a faith that is fearless. I can stand against the adversity of my times. I don't need to flinch. I don't need to, I don't need to get caught up in all the fear-mongering of our world. I can do what God's called me to do in this generation and recognize what God is speaking to us. And secondly, okay, secondly, think about this. Who in your world do you need to invite to come next week to Easter with you? How about being tougher than nails? How about being fearless? How about taking a handful of those invite cards back there? You know people in your world, whether in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your family, that you know desperately need Jesus. What better day than Easter Sunday when we celebrate what our faith is based on. That tomb is empty, my friends. We have an overcoming Savior. Therefore, despite the problems that are in our world, there is a faith that's strong enough. There's a faith that's bold enough that doesn't have to turn coward and run from the situations of life. There is a faith that's bold enough and fearless enough 
to see it through because why? Jesus, the great shepherd, Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, why will I fear no evil? Because you are with me. That's the invitation. There are people in your world desperately need to find the Savior that gave his life so that they can recover from the fear of death that every human being struggles with. We're going to talk about that next week, but think about it. How about being tough? How about being brave? How about saying, you know what, God, here am I? Because here's the deal. Let me close with this reality, okay? Somewhere around 89% of unchurched people said that they would attend a church service if someone ever invited them. And here's the dilemma. Only 2% of people of faith, only 2% of Christ followers actually ever invite anybody. How about we get tough as nails? How about we extend ourselves? How about we show the love of Christ to people desperately in need and just invite them to come?